so I am Susie Rogers. Um, I'm a former Paralympic swimmer. I competed for Paralympics GB at two Paralympic Games um, in London 2012 and Rio 2016. And um, I won gold in the 50 meters butterfly in Rio and two bronze medals in freestyle events. And I won three bronze medals in London 2012. So six in total across the two games. And I competed for about a decade in um, Paralympic swimming across sort of European and world level as well. Um, and I retired from sport in 2017. Um, and I now work on disability inclusion and have been working since uh, January 2020 in the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office as a an advisor on disability inclusion around firstly economic development programs and just recently I've joined the Global Health Directorate so lots of very wide-ranging work and I've got lived experience of disability myself. I was born missing the lower part of my left arm and left leg um, and I also have some kind of malformations of my right foot and leg so um, I have, have worn prosthetic limbs pretty much since day one. Yeah thanks. Um, so you said just then that you were um, competed for about a decade uh, and I know that you've said before that you were kind of inspired to to kind of get into swimming as a, as a sport after watching other people compete. I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that journey and um, and how you went from, you know, seeing someone uh, competing to competing yourself. Um yeah, I remember um, we won the bid to host the Paralympic Games and the Olympic Games in 2012. And, and that was announced in 2005, I think it was. And I had just graduated from university. I just finished my degree in languages. And um, I remember sort of being really aware about the bars. And that was kind of very early days um, in the build up. Obviously, it takes years of planning. Um, and I remember watching um, Beijing, the games in Beijing in 2008, and I was already starting to kind of get back into the sport. I had actually trained at university during my time there, but I focused more on the kind of academic work and less on the sport. And then I kind of got just caught up in the momentum of just competing and getting on the national level and then gradually sort of working my way up to kind of being recognised on the national scene and and then my first selected competition internationally was in 2011. So it was just literally the year before the Games, which was at the Europeans in um, European Championships in Berlin. So it, it kind of was um, something that had been building a while in the background, um, but I was still working. I wasn't on any kind of funding and, and it just kind of organically happened, really. Great. So you swam at university did you get into swimming while you're at school at all how did um how did you approach sports at a, at a younger age yeah I mean I was always super active my family always encouraged me to do activities and you know I think right from when I was young because I had a prosthetic leg um I think my my parents wanted me to be quite um active to keep the strength up so that I could manage walking around with the with the legs so I remember kind of hiking up mountains in the Lake District and, you know, being encouraged to, you know, keep really active as much as I could. But I would say it more came outside of school. At school, it was a bit disappointing, really, because I don't think they really knew what to do with me with my disability. I think very often it was like, oh, well, she can't do hockey or she can't do tennis, even though I, I probably could have. But I think it was too much of a chore for the teachers to take me to the tennis courts or um, because they were quite a long walk and it would require driving me down. So very often I ended up sort of sitting in the library and, you know, that I missed out on sport at school. And I think also when I was a teenager, I was very, I guess, very shy and mm -hmm. didn't really want to do sports that meant that I could be watched or looked at. And when I'm swimming, you know, I don't wear my prosthetic limbs. So I'm very much on show and back. I mean, people are a lot more accepting these days but when I was growing up in the kind of 90s um you know disability was still very much hidden and kept out of the way and and Paralympic sport didn't have the quite the same level of profile so um I tended to find that um I just didn't really want to engage in sport that meant that I was on show for being someone that didn't look like everybody else um so yeah I would say actually that's probably why I got into it later it was kind of 
more not so much on that I want to kind of go to a Paralympic Games but it was more of a way to meet people and to be social and because I just love swimming it's a passion for me you know I don't wear my prosthetic limbs when I'm swimming I'm completely free in the water so it's yeah it's just a really great form of exercise generally but I found it even more so because it's non-weight bearing and it's something that I can do and I can do really well. Yeah oh, it's really nice to hear that that kind of you found the sport that, that fit for you, uh, even though there'd been some like problems at school getting to that journey. Um, but it's, that you found it and, and were able to take it so far. It's very, very mm. impressive to come to a sport a bit later on and, and you know achieve what you've achieved. I think it's incredible. Um, so obviously at the moment, the Olympic Games are happening and the Paralympics are about to start and uh, you know millions of people around the world will be watching them. Um, so what role do you think the Paralympic Games in particular um, has in representing disability to a wider audience? Because often that will be their first engagement maybe with a disability sport. Yeah, I think it's great for encouraging people with disabilities to get involved in sport and physical activity and for health and well-being. I think that's a real win and an advantage of, of the Games. Um, you know, I think... The Paralympic Games has a, a certain amount of influence, I would say, but it's quite a short window of time. Um, and we found that with 2012, you know, evidence suggests that, yes, there was real engagement around it, but that kind of petered off. And I think, you know, it, it, it's really important. So from the kind of media perspective, and it has a, it has a lot of media coverage it has a lot of money and it has a lot of high profile so if you're thinking of it from a, I guess a marketing perspective yes it's great to kind of push out campaigns around it and use it as a platform to raise awareness um, but I think there's also a lot of other things that also need to be um, going on behind the scenes um, because it, it is a snapshot and then it kind of disappears really so whatever kind of commitments are set or whatever um, advantages that come from the games really um, there needs to be a lot of work behind the scenes to keep that going and I've only really found that out since stopping being an athlete and working in this space you know because I've had to educate myself a lot and, and learn a lot about the disability movement and about disability rights and I wouldn't have known that just from my own lived experience it comes from learning and educating yourself and and it sounds strange to say that as a disabled person but I don't know what it's like to have lots of different impairment types and to live in lots of different places so um you know that combination now has given me a lot more of an understanding of the very real issues faced by people around the world with disabilities. Yeah and I think what you're saying about the sort of legacy of the games and um and what the kind of responsibility broadcasters then have um what do you think they there's been quite a lot of conversation about how particularly the london uh, 2012 games were presented and the kind of language used around that i was wondering if you had any thoughts on like the kind of responsibilities the broadcasters have or during the games and then afterwards um in kind of how they how they present the sorts of sports that take part well i mean firstly Firstly, the sports are set by the International Paralympic Committee, so I guess they select the sports that are going to be part of the Games. The broadcasters really need to cover the sport because that's what people, I mean, it's the entertainment of it. If you look at the Olympics, people are very interested in the sport. They are interested in the peripheral, peripheral issues, but if you were to ask a lot of athletes, you know, they're there to be an athlete and they train just as hard as Olymp their Olympic counterparts, they work just as hard and they're representing their countries, that is what they're there to do. Um, and I think the broadcasters really, you know, if one thing could be improved, and I think there's a piece of research on this actually, is around the kind of types of impairments that are covered by broadcasters, because um, there tends to be a focus on more palatable disabilities, as it were. So things that are more appealing and, and for entertainment purposes, and I, I don't say that in a kind of a, a nasty way, but um, there can be preferential treatment. And I think I think it needs to be fair to include the full spectrum of impairment types if it is to really change perception. So, for example, you know, um, you know, focusing on uh, people with intellectual disabilities, for example, so that it isn't just all physical impairments, for example. So, um, 
yeah, I think I think there can be a tendency to focus on certain areas. And I think having that diversity of broadcasting within that umbrella of complexity of disability is really important. So that kind of focus on the on the physical um, that, that we sometimes see in the broadcasting, what sort of impact do you think that and kind of the Paralympics more broadly maybe has had on kind of disability rights movement? Like what place does the Paralympics have in that in that movement? Um, I think it's joining more into that movement and I think they're you know launching something around that this year um, I think it plays a role but I think and ultimately it, it is a sports organization it's not um, working entirely in human rights and government relations you know um, I think there needs to be an understanding of who does what in the space and it can be quite confused and muddled otherwise you want to make sure that that you're reaching the right people in the right way um, but the real power of the Paralympics, in my opinion, is the reach of, um, you know, encouraging people with disabilities into physical activity uh, for, me for mental and physical well-being. Um, you know, that that is a really powerful thing that could be driven forward. Um, so I think I think, it, you know, there's a lot. It's good that it's aligning more in that space. I think it's great that there's a conversation. Um, but I also think that there's a lot the Paralympic a committee could do to to really improve the sports and the classification process and make them more robust so it's not all just about rights which are very important but about getting the sport right so that it's fair for the athletes so that the athletes feel that when they're going and competing which is the purpose of the games that they're competing on a level playing field with competitors yeah of course um, i think that the point you make about it being a, a sports competition is really interesting and that the, the, the responsibility of the Paralympics committee is to is to make sure that people can take part is interesting obviously this year we've seen an athlete uh, withdraw because her support wasn't able to attend with her I just wonder if you have any thoughts on on that case in particular yeah I mean I did read about that um and I think you know it's not it's not really sending out a great message when you don't have the right reasonable accommodations in place to support your athletes to get there how can you then stand and say that you're an organization promoting the rights of people with disabilities if you're not going to allow for a reasonable accommodation and and that might be just that particular Paralympic committee rather than the whole movement but there should still be an understanding that you know this is this is the leader in this space so these kinds of things shouldn't really be happening if you're then to go out and tell the rest of the world how to do the rights of you know how to promote the rights of people with disabilities yeah um so as people are watching the olympics and the paralympics do you think there's anything in particular they should be thinking about anything they should be looking out for any conversations that you kind of hope are started uh, in the next few weeks and months i think working in health now um i think that conversation about you know physical movement mental health and well-being that comes from sport and physical activity and it doesn't have to be the traditional sports that are in the Paralympic Games it could be any kind of particular activity that appeals to the individual but I think you know finding that way to be healthy and and, and all those kind of aspects being an athlete you know are around you know making sure that yes you're you're training and you're competing at a high level but equally you know you've got to think about regular exercise you've got to think about um, you know, working on your own mental health to make sure you're prepared to race. You've got to think about um, your nutrition and the kind of foods that you're eating and putting in the body. So um, there's a lot of aspects of being an athlete that are quite useful for people to look at and take into their lives or, or not, if they think that it's not the right thing for them. But um, yeah, I hope, I hope it's helpful for people, um, you know, as long as we don't have any more lockdowns and leisure facilities are closing to kind of get out and be more active. But I mean, just generally since COVID happened, you know, and the pandemic, which has been, you know, super, very tragic in so many ways, and it has disproportionately impacted people with disabilities. But um, I've noticed that there's been an increase in, you know, physical activity, people getting out on bikes and walking and or, or going out into nature. And, you know, I think these things are really important lessons. So I guess um, I hope that that it's not just the Paralympic Games. I hope people learn from the last year that we've gone through as well, that, you know, what matters and what's important. And, um, you know, I think the Paralympics could amplify that, really. 
Yeah. Um, and you just touched a little bit there on the idea of mental health and how um, the athletes have to look after themselves. And obviously this year has been quite a big year, not just at the uh, Olympics and Paralympics, but the kind of seasons that have existed um, outside of that arena. Um, and they've really made headlines in cases, particularly young women who have been very honest about the impact and the pressure. Um, so I was wondering, do you think um, there's more that can be done by organising committees to, 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 work, to, to kind of support the mental health of current and former athletes like, like yourself? Um, like, what do you think is kind of missing uh, and what do you think is next in that conversation? Well, it's interesting because you know, if I talk about it from an athlete perspective, um, you get you do get access to sports psychology when you're on the team. Um, you don't get anything when you come off the team and when you retire. And I think that transition is quite tricky. And I've been navigating it for a while now. Um, and, you know, hand on my heart, it's not an easy thing to go through. Um, and maybe that's just my experience. But um, I've spoken to a couple of other similar athletes who've said, or athletes who have also similarly retired, who've said the same kinds of things. Um, but I think when you when you are going through that pr process, I mean, it's it's very intense levels of pressure. And you've seen that with the Olympics, you know, with Simone Biles, you know, pulling out of the final um, and citing that mental health was the reason behind that. I mean, I think that's incredibly brave because, you know, there's a lot at stake. And to be able to sort of step back from that and to say that actually I might I might walk away from this because it's better for me. Um, I think it's it's you know it's not easy um, going through that. And I think at any athlete of any level under that amount of pressure, um, you know, is going to is going to find it difficult. And I mean, I'm not even well known as an athlete. You know, I can't imagine what it must be like for someone like her to to have to deal with the amount of, of expectation that's put on her, let alone herself, because most athletes, if you talk to them, are very they put a lot of pressure on themselves to do well and to get a certain result. And, um, you know, I think that can be hard. I think it's good that we're having the conversations around these games and hopefully we'll have more around the Paralympics around mental health and well-being in that respect because it needs to be a conversation that's out there in the open and people need to feel like they can talk about that. And do you think that that conversation is a bit um, different in the Paralympic settings? Do you think that um, athletes have a different attitude towards talking about their mental health there? Um, and again, I suppose not just the athletes, people with disabilities more broadly about how how mental health is approached in, in that sort of space. Yeah, I mean, I believe that there is evidence um, or I've at least come across some kind of research or evidence that does suggest that if you have a disability, you're more likely to um, be prone to getting uh, mental health conditions because of facing but many, many barriers in, in life that exist. Um, and and so I think probably there's more more likelihood that it can can happen. Um, but I think it's probably um, I don't see why Paralympic athletes wouldn't feel comfortable talking about it. And I have seen some come out come out and say things on social media about about their own experiences, which which I really encourage and think it's great to see. Um, you know, and I think the more people that talk about it and and share those things, the better. Yeah. Um, and talking a bit about that uh, experience of Paralympians who are kind of sharing their stories, um, you, you've in the past talked a bit about the pressure some people with disabilities feel to become a Paralympic athlete mm -hmm. um, and, and why, uh, what, it would be really interesting to hear why you think that kind of expectation exists and should we be challenging it and, and how would we even start to, to do that? I think it's quite um it's because it's such a big platform um but it's not the only platform if you see what I mean there's a but you know it's there are other ways that you can live your life as a person with disability without having to be a Paralympian and I think um you know I don't think I particularly said anything on this in particular but I do whoever has said it I do agree that um you know there I think I think it's more maybe it's possibly a sport thing because people look to sports uh people as as sort of in, you know influencers and inspiration and and perhaps that's what what 
leads people to kind of associate to strive towards that but equally you know i've met some incredible people with disabilities working in the international development space um who are advocates and leaders in their own countries uh, you know going through really challenging experiences and talk to them and you know there's some incredible people doing some amazing things that people don't ever hear of um and i think you know maybe um you know the Paralympics hunt is great and and I you know I'm lucky to have been a Paralympian and be part of that movement um but I think there are also lots of lots of amazing people out there who are Paralympians who with disabilities who are doing some incredible things as well yeah so uh, what role do you think those kind of other sectors um can play in championing um you know people with disabilities and showing that that inclusion exists in spaces that aren't sport because I think I think I agree with you that, you know, the Paralympics just has such a high profile um, and, you know, it's on TV for, for three weeks um, every every few years um, that that's where they see people with disabilities achieve. Um, how do we reflect that in other sectors? Because obviously TV deals are not going to happen, you know, for international development, as you said. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, getting people with disabilities with the expertise in those spaces into positions of influence like senior positions so on boards on advisory boards at senior levels of organizations and not just within the disability sector i think you know it's very easy to pigeonhole yourself so um, a lot of the work i do is around disability inclusion in the mainstream it's not targeting people with disabilities but it's making sure that people with disabilities are included in mainstream programming so I think there's a lot that could be done to raise that awareness um, beyond that specific sector um, but again I think it's about having those voices and and elevating those voices whoever they are to to position senior positions where they can steer the conversations and, and be around the table and and um, you know really really impact on decision making so for example in health you know it's about you know ministries of health having designated disability inclusion advisors or inclusion advisors that cover disability alongside other protected characteristics so that we make sure that that is not forgotten in the conversation around you know health system strengthening for example or you know when you're looking at um, data for health information systems in countries so it's it's very much about having someone there that's thinking about it yeah, I think data is a really interesting one that we've seen uh, the the gap um, of data that doesn't exist around um, disability across the world has had a real impact with COVID response and, and recovery. So yeah. I think the the conversation in in that um, space will change, and that's a learning that will take away hopefully, um, and that's only going to benefit down the down the line. Um, so kind of looking looking forward a bit uh obviously the, I, I just said the games only take place every four years what what can people with disabilities do to get involved in sports all year round and what can everyone else do to to support those sports well interestingly we, we've only got less than a year until the winter paralympics which is next year so actually it's not every four years it's kind of every two years People always forget the Winter Games uh, Paralympics, but actually there's, there's some amazing events that go on. Um, um, but yeah, to keep it going, it's just about, um, I think everybody working in their spaces to do what they can. So, you know, there's a lot of people working really, really hard in this space, maybe behind the scenes um, and just kind of keeping pushing whatever you're doing, whatever your sphere of influence is. I mean, you know, I, I have my sphere of influence and there's some people that are on that big stage that are kind of really impacting on a huge level. But then, you know, I feel like I'm playing my small role and we've all got to continue doing that to keep challenging and to keep um, doing what we can where, where, where we are um, to just keep conversation going. and. Um, you know, hopefully it will kind of head more in the, I mean, I feel like the tide is turning, but it's it's heading in that right direction. So, um, you know, just, yeah, keeping working hard and, and raising visibility and awareness, really. Great. And is there any sports you're particularly looking forward to watching this summer? Well, some of my really close friends are swimming. Um, so, well, one of my very close friends is swimming, so I'll definitely be watching her, um, hoping she's going to come back you know, happy with her results, whatever she wins. Um, and yeah, I think so. So yeah, pr predominantly the swimming, I would yeah. say. Um, 
I, I kind of, I, I suppose I kind of like the obscure sports you don't see as much of. Um, so I, can't, I, I do quite like watching um, uh, the Taekwondo and I think Para Taekwondo is in for the first time. So I might watch this because I've watched it in the Olympics. Um, I might be wrong that it's in, but I think it is in, in the Paralympic Games. Um, uh, yeah, just kind of learning a bit more about the other sports out there and then thinking, oh, I might give that a go. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, well, it's going to be a very exciting summer, I'm sure. And obviously, if the Olympics are anything to go by, Team GB is going to come home with lots yeah. of... Yeah, I mean, we always do really well on the Paralympics GB yeah. side. So I, I have no doubt that they'll do amazingly well. Brilliant. They can uh, add, to, add to your brilliant record then. It'll be fantastic. Inclusion shouldn't stop at sport www.sitesavers.org